Hi, my name is Bryn Bostlett, and I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of California in San Francisco. And today I'm going to be talking to you about viral hepatitis, and in particular, hepatitis B and hepatitis D infections. By the end of this talk, you should be able to describe the epidemiology, modes of transmission, and pathogenesis of infections with hepatitis B and hepatitis D viruses. You should know the outcomes of infection, including the establishment of a chronic state, as well as methods of prevention. You should be able to list the serologic tests used for the diagnosis of hepatitis B and hepatitis D viruses, and you should be able to identify some strategies for the prevention of these viruses. Hepatitis B virus infects approximately one-third of the world's population. East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and the Amazon have the highest hepatitis B prevalence. Unlike the hepatitis A or hepatitis E virus, this virus can cause both an acute and also a chronic state. It is transmitted largely through the blood, which is known as parenteral transmission. In areas of the world that are endemic for the hepatitis B virus, many infections are acquired perinatally or in early childhood. Other populations at high risk for hep B infection include injection drug users, persons working in healthcare settings, or persons engaging in higher risk sexual activities, such as men who have sex with men and sex workers. Hepatitis B is unique amongst the hepatitis viruses in several ways. First, it's a DNA virus. You'll recall that all the other hepatitis viruses have an RNA genome. Second, Hepatitis B's double-stranded DNA is partially incomplete. Repair of the single-stranded portion occurs once it's inside the host cell, and a little more on this later. Finally, during its replication process, hepatitis B forms in excess of viral surface proteins as compared to its viral core. Therefore, when examining the blood of a patient with active hepatitis B infection, you can sometimes see whole virions called Dane particles with electron microscopy as well as individual viral proteins, which may form filamentous and spherular particles. Particles that are composed of envelope and surface proteins are called the hepatitis B surface antigens. Particles that are composed of the viral core are called the hepatitis B core antigens. Finally, proteolytic processing of the viral core also releases small protein fragments forming hepatitis B E antigens. These are important to know because our immune system produces antibodies against these particles that can help us to diagnose hepatitis B infection. Hepatitis B replicates its DNA genome through an RNA intermediate via reverse transcription, which is another unique feature. As such, it is classified as a pararetrovirus to differentiate it from conventional retroviruses like HIV, which contain an RNA genome. Upon entering a host cell, the viral double-stranded DNA, which you'll recall is incomplete, undergoes repair, forming what is called covalently closed circular DNA, or CCC DNA. The CCC DNA is then transcribed into RNA by host cell RNA polymerase, forming both messenger RNAs and pregenomic RNAs, which will be part of the hepatitis B viral core. The messenger RNAs are translated into viral proteins by ribosomes, while the pregenomic RNA is transcribed back into single-stranded RNA by the viral DNA polymerase. The new viruses are then transported to the cell surface uh, where they are assembled and released to go on to infect other cells. Another unique feature of hepatitis B is that it is a non-cytolytic virus, meaning the, the activity of the virus itself does not cause cell lysis or death. This leads to a longer symptom-free incubation period of between one and six months, during which a person may not know that he or she is infected with the virus. Cell damage is instead largely the result of our adaptive immune response, 
particularly virus-specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which kill infected cells and produce antiviral cytokines, purging the virus from living cells. Cytokines act to upregulate the immune response, and it is this robust infl inflammatory response that produces an acute hepatitis syndrome. Humoral response to the virus produces the virus-specific antibodies to help clear circulating viral particles. Unfortunately, this can sometimes lead to immune complex disease. Before moving on to diagnosis, let's define again the various components of the hepatitis B virus because there are several and it can get kind of confusing. Hepatitis B surface antigen is written as HBSAG. Recall that these antigens are composed of envelope and surface proteins. Antibodies against the surface antigen are called hepatitis B surface antibodies, which can be abbreviated as HBSAB or anti-hepatitis B surface. The hepatitis B core antigen is abbreviated HBCAG. These particles are composed of the viral core, which is the capsid, the viral DNA, and the viral polymerase. Antibodies against the core antigen are called hepatitis B core antibodies, which may be abbreviated HBCAB or else anti Hep B C. Finally, hepatitis B E antigen is abbreviated HBEAG. These antigens are formed by the proteolytic processing of the viral core, and antibodies against these proteins are called the hepatitis E antibodies, which again are abbreviated HBEAB or anti HBE. This can all get a little bit confusing, but I promise once you get used to seeing and writing these, it gets a lot easier. The typical course of hepatitis B infection involves the appearance of hepatitis B DNA in the serum, typically within the first two weeks of infection. Hepatitis B surface antigen typically appears within the first four weeks of infection. The surface antigen is the first serologic marker to appear in acute disease, and detection of this antigen in a person's serum means that they are currently infected with hepatitis B although it does not necessarily tell you about the timing of infection. More on this later. The antibodies against the hepatitis B surface antigen, known as the hepatitis B surface antibodies, can take over six months to be detectable in the blood. Importantly, it is these antibodies that give a person protective immunity against hepatitis B. If you find hepatitis B surface antibody in a person's blood, it can mean one of two things. Either they have resolved their hepatitis B infection on their own, or they have been immunized against the hepatitis B virus. The hepatitis B core antigen is not easily measured by conventional methods, and this assay is usually not available in most hospital laboratories. However, the antibodies against the core antigen, namely the core antibodies, are the first antibodies to appear in acute hepatitis B infection. Unfortunately, this antibody does not confer protective immunity against the virus. Anti-core antibody appears predominantly as IgM at about six to eight weeks after the initial infection. It is also the only serologic test that will be positive in the so-called window period of infection during which the other serum markers, such as hepatitis B DNA, surface antigen, E antigen, and surface antibody, have all either disappeared or are not yet found in the blood. The anti-hepatitis C antibody persists often for life, but after about six months of the infection, the total anti-hepatitis B core antibody mainly consists of IgG instead of IgM. For patients with resolved hepatitis B infection, the IgM anti-hep B antibody is not usually detectable after about six months. With chronic hepatitis B infection, the IgM 
core antibody may remain detectable at very low levels, even for years after infection. Overall, the diagnosis of acute hepatitis B infection is made when the hepatitis B surface antigen and the hepatitis B core IgM are found to be positive. The hepatitis B E antigen appears soon after the surface antigen, and detection of this antigen means that the virus is actively replicating. Recall that the E antigens are formed by the proteolytic processing of the viral cores. Detection of E antigens is typically correlated to higher levels of circulating DNA, and thus higher infectiousness of the virus. The E antigen may be short-lived, and thus is not typically sent as part of the screening for acute hepatitis B infection. In the typical course of resolving infection, patients will develop anti-E antibodies. Like anti-core antibodies, these unfortunately do not provide any immunity against the virus, but they do usually mean a lower overall burden of disease and thus lower infectivity. Resolution of the hepatitis B infection can be assessed starting at around six months after the acute infection, at which point we expect the infection to be controlled. Evidence of resolved infection includes the normalization of liver function tests, having an undetectable hepatitis B DNA surface antigen, having a positive hepatitis B surface antibody, and having a positive hepatitis B core antibody. E antigen and E antibodies are not typically measured if the above conditions exist, as they are usually more helpful for informing the level of activity of the virus in a more chronic state of infection. Unfortunately, not everyone who is infected with hepatitis B goes on to resolve their infection. Resolution of hepatitis B infection depends upon a number of factors, but age of infection is a major influence. In parts of the world where hepatitis screening and vaccination are less available, many infants acquire hepatitis B at birth when they are exposed to the blood and bodily fluids of their infected mothers. Their immune systems are immature and are unable to effectively clear the virus, so up to 90% of these exposed babies will go on to develop chronic hepatitis B infection. As we age and our immune systems become better able to deal with this virus, exposure is less likely to cause chronic disease. As such, only around 10% or less of adults who are exposed to the hepatitis B virus will become chronic carriers. Adults with underlying comorbidities such as immunosuppressive conditions or other liver diseases, however, may be more susceptible. Like the other hepatitis viruses, severe, life-threatening hepatitis can occur with hepatitis B infection. However, it's rather rare. In those patients who go on to develop chronic hepatitis B, the timing of the appearance of early serologic markers of infection is very similar to other patients. Hepatitis B DNA appears first, with hepatitis B surface antigen and E antigen soon to follow, and the core antibody is, again, the first antibody to appear. However, unlike those patients who will resolve their infection, the hepatitis B surface antigen and E antigen will persist beyond six months, as will the hepatitis B DNA. In these patients, protective surface antibody never forms. Depending on the level of viral activity, hepatitis B E antibodies may or may not form. Those patients with the most actively replicating virus will continue to produce E antigen and won't produce any E antibody, while those who are hepatitis B carriers with inactive virus may actually have detectable E antibody and no E antigen. Also, depending on how active the virus is, liver function tests may or may not be elevated. Here's a nice table that you can use as an overview for some of these confusing serologic and um, DNA tests. In terms of the treatment for hepatitis B, 
Antiviral medications are sometimes recommended for use in more chronic infections with hepatitis B. Some medications that have been studied include interferon alpha, as well as several of the nucleoside analogs, including lamivudine, entecavir, and adofavir. These are usually only used in patients who have chronic active forms of the hepatitis B virus. For patients who have severe disease, such as fulminant hepatitis B, or patients who have long-standing chronic disease and go on to unfortunately develop cirrhosis as a result of their hepatitis B infections, liver transplant may be the only option for treatment. Immunization with hepatitis B vaccine is the most effective means of preventing hepatitis B infections in adults and has been available since 1982. The complete vaccine series induces protective surface antibody levels in more than 95% of people who have the vaccine. Protection lasts for at least 20 years and is probably lifelong. Preventing hepatitis B infection during infancy and early childhood is particularly important because of the high likelihood of chronic hepatitis B infection and chronic liver disease in these patients. In the United States, most persons with hepatitis B acquired the infection as adolescents or adults. However, efforts to vaccinate persons in the major risk factor groups have had limited success. Moreover, over one-third of patients with acute hepatitis B do not have readily identifiable risk factors, and so these populations can be very difficult to target. Another strategy for preventing hepatitis B disease is testing to identify pregnant women who are hepatitis B surface antigen positive and then providing their infants with immunoprophylaxis through both immunization and also passive antibody administration, which effectively prevents hepatitis B transmission during this crucial perinatal period. This strategy can also be used for adults who have possibly been exposed to a hepatitis B virus carrier through occupational hazards such as a needle stick injury. The hepatitis D virus is also known as the Delta agent, and it is a single-stranded RNA virus. However, this virus is defective at uh, replication, and it actually requires hepatitis B surface antigen for its envelope. Therefore, patients who are infected with hepatitis D usually require hepatitis B co-infection either at the same time as the hepatitis D virus or in a patient who has been exposed to hepatitis B first and then later exposed to hepatitis D. The hepatitis D virus has similar transmission risks as to hepatitis B infection, including IV drug use, high-risk sexual exposures, being from an endemic area, or other needle stick injuries. Whenever patients have hepatitis B and hepatitis D acquired at the same time, this is called co-infection. And oftentimes, hepatitis B antibody will develop and be protective for both viruses. However, if you acquire hepatitis D later, after hepatitis B infection has been well-established, this situation is called superinfection. And in these patients, a very severe hepatitis can develop with a 5 to 15% mortality rate. There is no specific vaccine against the hepatitis D virus. However, you can prevent it by vaccinating patients against hepatitis B. Here is a table showing an overview, a compare contrast between the different viruses uh, that we have already discussed. And here are some of my image credits. Thank you very much for your time and attention.